good to see you all in God's house today. We welcome you in the Savior's precious name, and especially if you're visiting with us, we give you a very warm welcome. We're going to open our service uh, this morning by singing a children's hymn. It's hymn number 704 in our own hymn book. If I come to Jesus, he will make me glad. He will give me pleasure when my heart is sad. And after the singing of this hymn, we're going to have uh, the dedication of the baby sons of Mr. and Mrs. McIntosh. So do remember that. But let's stand to sing this lovely hymn uh, and let us really praise the Lord as we open our service in worship today. Amen. Let's all stand to sing. congregation may be seated. I have to say before we start, this is a first for me. For during 30 years of ministry, I've never dedicated twins before. So this is a very happy occasion for us all today. And we do pray we'll know the blessing of the Lord uh, in our service just now. We're going to read, of course, some portions of Scripture that we always read at a time of dedication. First of all, 1 Samuel chapter 1, uh, concerning young Samuel. It says in verse 20, Wherefore it came to pass, when the time was come about after Hannah had conceived, that she bare a son and called his name Samuel, saying, Because I have asked him of the Lord. And the man Elkanah and all his house went up to offer unto the Lord the yearly sacrifice and his vow. But Hannah went not up, for she said unto her husband, I will not go up until the child be weaned. 
And then I would bring him that he may appear before the Lord and there abide forever. And Elkanah, her husband, said unto her, Do what seemeth thee good, tarry until thou hast weaned him. Only the Lord establish his word. So the woman abode and gave her son suck until she weaned him. And when she had weaned him, she took him up with her with three bullocks and one ephah of flour and a bottle of wine and brought him unto the house of the Lord in Shiloh. And the child was young. And then some verses over in Matthew's Gospel. In Matthew's Gospel, chapter 18, it says, At the same time came the disciples unto Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus called a little child unto him, and set him in the midst of them, and said, Verily I say unto you, Except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whosoever shall receive one such little child in my name, receiveth me. And then those very familiar words in Mark's Gospel, chapter 10. Verse 13 says, And they brought young children to him, that he should touch them. And his disciples rebuked those that brought them. But when Jesus saw it, he was much displeased and said unto them, Suffer the little children to come unto me, and forbid them not, for if such is the kingdom of God. Verily I say unto you, Whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as little child, he shall not enter therein. And he took them up in his arms, put his hands upon them, and blessed them. Amen. And we know the Lord would bless the reading of his word to all of our hearts. Would the congregation please stand? <coughs> Do you, the parents of this child, know and acknowledge the Lord Jesus Christ as your own and personal Savior? Do you promise God giving you the grace and help to bring these children up in the fear and admonition of the Lord? Following the example of Scripture and the words of the Lord Jesus Christ, when he said, Suffer the little children to come unto me, and forbid them not, for if such is the kingdom of God, I dedicate thee, Mason Noel McIntosh, and Elliot William McIntosh, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. Let's all bow in a wee word of prayer. Our loving and eternal Heavenly Father, we do thank thee and praise thee for thy blessings today. We thank thee, Lord, for the gift of children. And, O oh God, we thank Thee for these two boys, Mason and Elliot. We thank Thee, Lord, for bringing them safely into this world and keeping Your hand upon Jessica. And, O oh God, we do pray that early in life, that when they come to know the difference between right and wrong, that both these boys would come to trust Thee as their own and personal Saviour. We pray that you bless Brian and Jessica and the family circle today. We thank thee for them all. We ask thee, Lord, that you would bless their homes, indeed bless all of our homes. We thank thee, Lord, for our children and for our grandchildren. We thank thee for the little ones. We praise thee what Jesus said, Suffer the little children to come unto me and forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of God. We thank thee, Lord, for the faith of children. And, O oh God, you've said in your word that unless we all have the faith of a child. They will not enter into the kingdom of God. O oh God, we praise Thee today, and we thank Thee for the simplicity of God's salvation, that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And O oh God, just as a little child will take simply the word of a mother or father, help us all, Lord, to simply trust what Jesus has said concerning his eternal salvation, that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. We thank thee, Lord, for thy mercy. So bless us now. We just commit this service to thee. 
In Jesus' precious name we ask it. Amen. Amen. The congregation may be seated. We're going to sing another hymn at this point of our service. It's hymn number 687. It's another children's hymn. It's a lovely hymn. There's a friend for little children above the bright blue sky. A friend who never changes, whose love will never die. And again, we'll stand after the introduction, please. Let's sing it out with all of our hearts. Let's all stand the same.
Please turn in your Bibles for our scripture reading this morning to 2 Timothy, the second epistle of Paul to Timothy and the chapter 1, please. 2 Timothy chapter 1. We're going to read some verses uh, at the beginning of this chapter. We'll read from verse 1. If you haven't a Bible with you, just listen very carefully uh, to the reading of God's precious word today. 2 Timothy 1 and the verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, according to the promise of life which is in Christ Jesus. To Timothy, my dearly beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God, whom I serve from my forefathers with pure conscience, that without ceasing I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day, greatly desiring to see thee, being mindful of thy tears, that I may be filled with joy. When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith, or if you like, the genuine faith, that's what the word unfeigned means there, the genuine faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in our grandmother in thy grandmother Lois, and thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that in thee also. Wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, or of me his prisoner, but be thy partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God, who hath saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began, but is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, whereunto I am appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles, for the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Amen. We'll end our reading there at verse 12, knowing the Lord will bless the public reading of his precious word to all of our hearts. Once again, could I take this opportunity of welcoming each and every one along to our service today, and especially those who are visiting with us, and especially those who have come in because of the dedication. We do pray that the Lord will come and meet with us, and we're always delighted to see visitors, and especially around this holiday time now when so many of our own folk are away on holiday. And we do pray that the Lord will come and bless us even this morning around his precious, precious word. I would ask you to remember the young people. All our young people are away this weekend uh, for a weekend uh, of fellowship. And God willing, they'll be coming home sometime this evening. But pray that the Lord will give them journeying mercies. And also I'd ask you to pray for our sister Esther McKee. Esther's going out to Nepal this week. Esther, of course, is one of our students connected with our church here in Tandragee. That's in the Bible College, the Whitfield College of the Bible. And she's making a journey on Tuesday, quite a lengthy journey. So you pray for her. Pray that the Lord will bless her as she goes out to the land of Nepal for a, a few weeks. The announcements are as follows, and over the summertime, of course, uh, they're brief. There's no, uh, no prayer meeting this Tuesday night because of the holiday week, so please just take note uh, of that. Remember about the gospel service tonight in the will of the Lord, and I'll be here this evening to preach in uh, the gospel service and pray that the Lord will come and meet with us. Our sis sister Joanna McCammon will be along this evening to sing for us. And if you can come along at 6.30, you'll be made very, very welcome. That's preceded by the half hour of prayer. And if you can come that little bit earlier, then you come and pray with us. 
Remember, the service is next Lord's Day at 11.30 in this house and 6.30 in the evening. And next Lord's Day, our brother, Mr. Johnny Jordan, will be coming along again uh, to preach. Johnny, of course, is walk, working alongside us now, and he's finished in the Bible College. God willing, he'll be licensed in September. And you pray for him, pray for all of the students, <clears throat> that the Lord will open up doors for each and every one of them. <clears throat> but Johnny will be here next Lord's Day to take the services, and our sister Manly Ray will be here next Sunday evening uh, to sing at the Gospel Rally. Those services again are preceded by the half hour of prayer. <clears throat> now, over the summer this year again, we're going to have a number of drive-in services in the evening. The last two Sunday nights of July and the first two Sunday nights in August will be drive-in services. So again, it's an opportunity to invite others in under the sound of the gospel. And we know that over these past number of years now, we have had quite a number of visitors in that have come along to the drive-in services. So do get the word out that we're having these special drive-in services and invite uh, as many in as possible. Remember the Holiday Bible Club this year again from the 5th to the 9th of August. And again, uh, we will encourage as many to help in that special uh, Holiday Bible Club as possible. Certainly it's always a time of blessing when so many boys and girls come in under the sound uh, of uh, the gospel. Now there's no children's church now until September. Do keep that in mind as well. Parents, I'd like to thank our sister Vivian Badger and all those who have helped her over this past term for helping out in the children's church. Very much appreciated. And do pray for all of the children, the young people over the holiday time that the Lord will keep his good hand uh, upon them. I think that's all the announcements. We're going to sing another hymn and the offering is going to be taken up. Again, it's another children's hymn. 701, Come to the Saviour, make no delay. Here in his word he has shown us his way. Here in our midst he's standing today, tenderly saying, Come, we'll just keep our seats as the offering is being taken up.
please turn again to that portion of Scripture that we read earlier in 2 Timothy chapter 1. Now, we will be turning to a number of Scriptures this morning. So, just to draw your attention to that, and we would ask you, if you're able, to turn to these wonderful portions of God's Word. Now, before we bring the Word that I believe the Lord has laid upon our hearts for today, let's bow in a wee word of prayer and ask the Lord for His help as we come to consider God's truth. Let's all bow in prayer. Father in heaven, we thank Thee and we praise Thee for Your love to us. We thank Thee for dying upon the cross and upon that cross shedding Your precious blood in order to purchase our eternal salvation. We're so thankful today, Lord, that we're saved and on our way to heaven. And O God, we pray that You would come and, Lord, increase our faith, strengthen our faith, even this day. Those of us who are saved, Lord, that we might grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray, Lord, that you would defeat the devil. We're so conscious of his devices. But, Lord, we pray today that you would bind the strong man in Jesus' name and help us, Lord, only to say those things that will be pleasing to thee. And, Lord, for those in our congregation, perhaps who are still strangers to grace and to God, that even this day, Lord, that you would reveal unto them their great need of God's salvation. For it's in Jesus' precious name we ask it. Amen. For a few moments at the end of our service today, I want to preach on the subject, the positive statements of the Apostle Paul. The positive statements of the Apostle Paul. The positive statements of the Apostle Paul, of course, are far far more numerous than we could mention today. When you consider what Paul said in the book of Acts, and also consider his epistles in the New Testament, the truth is that it would take all of this week and next week for us to consider the positive statements that Paul uttered under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit when he was in his public ministry upon this earth. But this morning I want to draw your attention to one line of thought concerning these personal positive statements of the Apostle Paul. And I want you to consider what Paul said in relation to his knowledge of God's salvation. As you study the writings of the Apostle Paul, you learn very quickly that Paul was a man who spoke positively and confidently about his own salvation. He did not use terms like maybe or hope when he spoke of his redemption, but he always spoke dogmatically and confidently as one who knew his present and future spiritual standing before God. There's never a hint of doubt in any of Paul's statements concerning where and with whom he would spend eternity. There's never a hint of doubt in any of Paul's statements that the salvation that he had received was anything but glorious and genuine and true and everlasting. And as we come to look at these positive statements of the Apostle Paul in regards to his own salvation and his future life, I pray that these words and this very simple message this morning will encourage the saints of God. If you're saved and you love the Lord today, then I pray that God's Word will come with freshness to your heart and will build you up in your most holy faith. You know, we're living in an age of uncertainty and confusion. And unfortunately, that spirit of uncertainty and confusion has entered into the hearts and lives of many of God's people, with the result that many saints of God are living their lives full of doubts and fears about the future. But you know, child of God, this ought not to be, because as far as the Christian is concerned, our future is bright. Our future, indeed, is secure in Christ. Our future is not depending upon what is happening or not happening in this 
world. And we must never forget that. You know, the interesting truth is this. No matter what was happening in this world in the days of the Apostle Paul, his confidence in Christ, his Savior, never wavered. Now, you should take the time to study the circumstances of this world at the time of the Apostle Paul. And, of course, you will know if you have done that, that the Apostle Paul suffered great persecution. And, indeed, the church of Jesus Christ as a whole at that time suffered great persecution. And yet, in the midst of the severest trials, when we come to consider these glorious statements that the Apostle Paul made in relation to his salvation, we see that here's a man who had great confidence, not in himself, not in other Christians, not in his circumstances around him, but he had great confidence in God and in his Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And child of God, the truth is, whatever is happening around us in this world today, we must never lose sight of our blessed Redeemer. Indeed, that's why Paul said in one occasion, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Isn't that tremendous? Not only is he the author of our faith, but he's the finisher of our faith. What are these positive statements that I want to draw your attention to today. Well, first of all, I want to say this, that Paul knew that Jesus Christ was his Savior. I want you to take a look at what Paul says here in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 9 and 10, and then at the latter part of verse 12. But look at verse 9 and 10 first of all. Here's what he says. Now, this is a positive statement concerning Christ as his Savior. He's speaking about the Lord Jesus here, and he says, "...who hath saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began, but is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ." who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Now look at the latter part of verse 12. Look at this positive statement. For I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Not only did Paul preach that the Lord Jesus Christ was the only Savior, but Paul knew this only Savior as his Savior. Paul had made peace with God, you see, through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. He said in Romans 5 verse 1, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul had a personal faith in Jesus Christ. He had met the Lord, and the Lord had saved him, and he had confidence in that Savior day by day as he walked upon this scene of time. And he knew this with full assurance. You know, child of God, you and I, as we sit in God's house today, we have something to rejoice in. And we have something to praise God for. That is our Savior. The one who has redeemed us for time and for eternity. And thank God, just as the Apostle Paul had confidence in knowing that Jesus Christ was his Savior, that he was redeemed by the precious blood of the Lamb, so you and I can come today and we can come before God in confidence, knowing that whatever is happening in this old world around us, we have a Savior. We have a Redeemer. And his name is Jesus Christ. Let me ask you a question before we go any further. Do you have this confidence that Jesus Christ is your Savior this morning? Can you honestly say 100% that you have been redeemed, not with corruptible things such as silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ? I pray if you can't, that even today that you will come and put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus as your own and personal Redeemer. But here's the question. 
Why had Paul this confidence and assurance? He had this confidence and assurance because he believed the promises of Christ. He believed the promises of God's Word. You see, our faith is based not upon our feelings. Our faith is based upon the Word of God and the Word of God alone, on the promises of Christ. Someone once said, it is the blood of Christ that takes away our sins, but it is the promises of Christ and the Word of God that takes away our doubts. And how true that statement is. You and I today, we know we can't be saved without the shedding of blood. There is no remission. The Lord Jesus had to die and he had to go to that cross and upon that cross he had to shed his precious blood and because of that work that he accomplished upon Golgotha's brow, you and I, no sins forgiven. The blood of Christ takes away our sins. But it is the Word of God and the promises of Christ that takes away our doubts. Isn't that right? You know, Satan would seek to attack the child of God today. Satan seeks to attack the child of God by attacking our faith in God's Word, by seeking to make us doubt the Scriptures of truth, by seeking to take away our confidence in the promises of Christ. There's no greater blessing in this world than to have the assurance of personal faith in the Lord Jesus. I wonder, is there a child of God here today or perhaps someone listening on to the social media and you're saved, you've trusted the Lord as your Redeemer, but in recent days or recent weeks or recent months you've had doubts about your salvation. And perhaps the devil is giving you a hard time. Well, join the club because he gives us all a hard time. Someone once said, indeed it was C.H. Spurgeon, I think, he said that he doubted the Christian who never doubted. And in all of our lives, no matter how long we're saved, the old devil can get into our minds and he can put doubts in there, just like he did with our first parents in the Garden of Eden. You remember how he came to the woman and he said to the woman, has God really said it? Did God really say that? And he began to put doubts in her mind whether the Word of God was true or not. And he's still the same today, you know, in this 21st century. But child of God, you and I, we should never doubt the Word of God and we should never doubt the promises of the Lord Jesus Christ. You remember that wonderful promise that the Lord Jesus Christ gave to his disciples on one occasion in John chapter 10. He said this, I give unto my sheep eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of mine hand. And thank God when we turn to the Word of God, when we read the promises of the Savior, and when we read the promises that God has given to us in regards to our salvation in the Bible, then we can go forward with confidence, knowing, like the Apostle Paul, that He has redeemed us and saved us, and that Jesus Christ is our Savior for time and for eternity. You remember what Thomas said on one occasion? He said, My Lord and my God. He directed those words to Christ. Child of God, Christ is our Lord and our God. You remember what Job said on one occasion, for I know that my Redeemer liveth. Dear believer, the Lord Jesus Christ is our Redeemer. You remember what the psalmist said in Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. Dear believer, saint of God, the Son of God is our shepherd. Remember what David said again in Psalm 28. He said, unto thee will I cry, O Lord, my rock. Thank God today the Lord is our rock, dear child of God. And you'll notice that again, all of these saints that I have mentioned this morning, and there are just a few uh, from the Bible that I've quoted from, they come and they speak with confidence and they speak with assurance. And thank God you and I today, no matter what trial we're going through, no matter what folly we have entered into, no matter what the devil is throwing our way. 
Thank God we know this. We know whom we have believed. And the one that we have believed in and trusted in is the one who has saved us. And thank God we can go forward with confidence today. Child of God, be encouraged. Jesus Christ is your Savior. He has redeemed you. And He has redeemed you for, for all eternity. Oh, I pray that God will use His Word. You know, one of my favorite Psalms is Psalm 62. And when you read Psalm 62, and I would encourage you to read it, especially when you're down and especially when doubts arise in your heart concerning your salvation. Psalm has said this in Psalm 62, verse 1, Truly my soul, there's his personal faith in the Lord, Truly my soul waiteth upon God, from him cometh my salvation. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense, I shall not be greatly moved. And then verse 5 says, My soul, wait thou only upon God, for my expectation is from Him. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be moved. In God is my salvation and my glory. The rock of my strength and my refuge is in God. And then my favorite verse, Trust in the Lord at all times, ye people. Pour out your heart before Him, for God is a refuge for us. Oh, thank God today. We can confidently sail with the Apostle Paul that Jesus Christ is our Savior and that He has redeemed us. But I want you to turn over quickly. I want you to turn over in your Bible just for a moment to 2 Timothy chapter 4. Because here in 2 Timothy chapter 4, we have another one of these positive statements of the Apostle Paul. Now, Paul, in this positive statement here, speaks about heaven. And he also speaks about hell. But the point I want to make is this. Paul knew that he was going to heaven and that he would never be in hell. Now, just read these verses carefully. Take a look at 2 Timothy chapter 4. They're familiar verses, I'm sure, to most of us. And I'm going to deal with them in a lot more detail, God willing, tonight. But look at verse 6 of 2 Timothy 4. Paul says this, For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight, I have finished my course, I have kept the faith. Now here's the positive statement. Henceforth there is, not maybe, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, he shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. What a positive statement that is. Here Paul confidently declares just before he dies that he's going to heaven. Paul has this assurance. He knows in his heart that as soon as he takes his last breath upon this earth that it will be absent from the body and present with the Lord. Now to fully grasp that statement there, that positive statement in 2 Timothy chapter 4, you've got to understand the circumstances that Paul is in here. He's in prison for his faith. He's confined to a cell because of his faith. Very soon he's going to be taken from that prison cell and he's going to be executed for his faith. And yet, in the midst of those circumstances, the Apostle Paul could lift up his heart and he could speak these words Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me on that day. Oh, child of God, what a tremendous statement when you consider the circumstances that these words were penned in. No matter what our circumstances today, and there's none of us in a prison cell, and there's none of us at this present moment going to die for our faith, we have the liberty, and thank God for the liberty, the free and the religious liberty that we have in this country. We can go where we want. We can do what we please. We have the liberty of going and serving the Lord wherever we please. Isn't it wonderful? Oh, let's realize today that what the Lord 
did for Paul, he has done for you and for I. Thank God today we can say with confidence that we're heaven bound. We're going home to glory soon to see the city bright, to walk the golden streets of heaven and bask in God's own light. Paul said in Philippians 1 verse 23, For I am in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. So here in this positive statement, the Apostle Paul is declaring that he's going to heaven. He knows that he's going to heaven. Just let me ask you a question today before we go on. Do you know you're going to heaven? If you were to die right now, would you be sure that you'd be in heaven? My friend, this is the blessed hope of the child of God. But then, just turn back a few pages to 2 Thessalonians chapter 5. 2 Thessalonians chapter 5. And you will notice here how Paul states clearly that he would never be in hell. Now, if you're going to heaven, you're not going to hell. But notice the positive statement here that Paul makes concerning this. Look what it says in verse 9 and 10. Tremendous verses of Second, uh, First Thessalonians chapter 5 there. Look what it says in verse 9 and 10. It says, For God hath not appointed us to wrath. He's speaking to the people of God here. The wrath, he's speaking about the wrath of God there, the judgment that's going to fall upon this world someday. And he says, God hath not appointed us. God hath not appointed the Christian. God has not appointed the believer to wrath. But to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another even as also ye do. Here Paul confidently states that he will never receive the wrath of God, but rather when he dies, he will be with Christ in heaven forever. Oh, child of God, is, this is our confidence. This is our assurance. What a blessed hope you and I have today. Is there someone today? You know, as I go about from day to day, from week to week, speaking to people, as I've done so now for many years. I've spoken to many of God's people, and they have had doubts and fears, perhaps uncertainty concerning the future. And the old devil has got in on them. And perhaps today there's a poor child of God here this morning or listening on, and you're at rock bottom, and perhaps... You're really feeling the heat of the battle and even beginning maybe even to doubt your salvation. Am I really saved? I remember talking to a girl many years ago, a genuine Christian girl, godly girl, but she had doubts of her salvation. She couldn't get the assurance of salvation. And I had to turn her to the Word of God, friend, because we have nothing else, only the Word of God. The Word of God gives us the assurance. The Word of God increases our faith. The more we read the Bible, the more we learn the verses that I'm quoting and many others. That's how you get faith. The entrance of God's Word giveth light. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. And that's why the Apostle Paul was a man who with great confidence, knowing that Jesus Christ was his Savior, knowing that he was going to heaven, knowing that he would never be lost, because he believed the promises of God's truth. It's God's Word that takes away our doubts. Oh, I pray today that the Lord will come. My friend, have you that, this assurance that you'll never be lost? You'll notice again, let me emphasize again, what the Apostle Paul was trusting in. He was trusting in the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at verse 10 of the text. Who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. He knew that the blood of Christ had taken away his sins, but he recognized that it was the Word of God that takes away his doubts. Oh, thank God today we have a wonderful, glorious gospel to preach. When the Lord Jesus died upon that middle tree on Golgotha's brow, 
he cried this cry, it is finished. Or just one word actually in the original, finished. Thank God, child of God, our redemption is complete. We are complete in Christ. As far as our eternal salvation is concerned, that's why you and I will never be lost. Truly saved, genuine, genuinely saved. We can never be lost because of that wonderful work that the Lord Jesus accomplished on the middle tree on Golgotha's brow. He finished the work for you and for me. He became our substitute. He died in our room instead. And because of the work that He accomplished and finished and completed upon Calvary's middle tree, thank God I am secure in Christ and saved for all eternity. That's why Paul had this confidence. That's why he could make these positive statements. Paul knew that he was a man who could never be lost. Oh, can you say this this morning? I threw the challenge out to each and every one of you. Can you say this, my friend? Can you say that Jesus Christ is your Savior? Do you know that? Paul says, I know whom I have believed. Do you know that you're going to heaven, never be in hell? Paul said, he knew that once he would die, there was laid up for him a crown of righteousness. He knew that God had not appointed him to wrath, but to eternal salvation. Statements, glorious statements. Now there's one more I, have to, I want to draw your attention to. Just take a look again in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 for a moment there. And I'll be very brief. We're nearly finished. Thirdly, Paul knew that Jesus Christ would come again the second time. Now, this had to do with his future as well. This had to do with his, his eternal salvation as well, because if Jesus Christ was not going to come again, then Paul would not know anything about salvation. If Jesus Christ was still in the grave, if he had not had risen again and ascended up into heaven, if he was not coming again, there would be no redemption for Paul or anyone else. But again, we can see this positive statement. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 14. We read down to verse 16. Look at it and pick out the positive statements. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord. There's the positive statement. He doesn't say, well, if the Lord comes again. He says, unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep, for the Lord himself shall, shall descend from heaven. Notice the positivity of the statement here. Shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then look at 2 Thessalonians 1 verse 7. He continues this subject as he speaks to the Thessalonian believers. And to you who are troubled, rest with us. When? Underline it. Notice again, it's a positive statement concerning the second coming of Jesus Christ. He doesn't say, if the Lord Jesus. He says, when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with mighty angels. Now, I don't know about you, but those words and those statements greatly encourage me in my Christian faith and in my Christian walk with God. It doesn't matter what's happening out there. The whole world could be crumbling down around us. But Jesus Christ is coming again. Hallelujah. My friend, can you say that confidently? That Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is coming again. Here is another positive statement from Paul. And in this positive statement, Paul confidently declares that the Savior will soon come. And one of the reasons why the Savior is coming again is in order to bring his redeemed children home to glory. Christ is coming the second time to give his saints their eternal reward. And although when Christ comes again, this world will be judged for its sin, the saints of God will live forever with their Savior in the glory land. Isn't that tremendous? I think it's tremendous. Child of God, do you get excited when you read statements like this? Does your heart fill up with emotion and thanksgiving to God when you read statements like this? 
This is what Paul is dogmatically stating and positively affirming that his Savior, the one who has saved him, the one who has redeemed him, is coming the second time. What a blessing today. You know, there's no doubt that we're all living in the last of the last days. I believe that the Lord Jesus will soon come again and everything's pointing towards that. All we have to do is to look around us and see what's happening in this world. Scripture is being fulfilled every week, indeed every day. And very soon the Savior is coming again. Is He coming for you? The Lord Jesus said before He left this scene of time, Be ye also ready. Be ye also ready. For in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. Can you say with confidence that when Christ comes the second time, that you will be gathered with the saints in glory to live with Christ for all eternity? Oh, my friend, if you can't. My prayer is that even this morning, you will come and put your faith in the Lord Jesus. But child of God, those of us who have this confidence, let us day by day live in the light of His second coming. And let us each day be watching for His second coming. Isn't that what the apostle exhorted us to do? Look up, for your redemption draweth nigh. And if it drew nigh in Paul's day, surely it must be drawing even nearer today. Turn over just, this is the last reference to Revelation chapter 5. And I just want to read this chapter or these verses to you. What a tremendous portion of Scripture it is. We're just looking at some of the positive statements that Paul made. But here's a positive statement that another apostle made, the apostle John. And again, I want you to think of the circumstances in which he wrote these words. Very important to consider the circumstances in which some of these writers, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, wrote the words. John was on the Isle of Patmos, banished for his faith. Banished for his faith because he loved the Lord. You know, child of God, there are many Christians in this world today in communist countries, and they're imprisoned today because of their faith. You and I have it. We have it, we have it so easy, really, when you think about there's Christians in communist countries today, and they're being persecuted for their faith. They're dying for their faith. Thank God for the liberty that we have. But the, here John writes these tremendous words, again banished for his faith in the Isle of Patmos. Look at verse 8 of Revelation 5. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, of odors, which are the prayers of saints. Now listen to this. And they sang a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and has made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. And I beheld, and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne, and the beasts and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000, and thousands of thousands added up, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Child of God, there's no knowing what the Lord has prepared for them that love Him. Eye hath not seen nor ear heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man the things that God hath prepared for them that love Him. Heaven's going to be a wonderful place. And I'm going to heaven. Are you going to heaven? Child of God, don't let the devil rob you of the assurance of your salvation. But believe the promises of the book and go on serving the Lord till He comes again. And go on with confidence 
Not in, not in ourselves. The confidence is not in ourselves. The confidence is in the one who loved us, died for us, rose again for us, and someday will come again for us. That's where our confidence lies. That's where Paul's confidence lay, and that's why he could make these positive statements. Isn't it wonderful? May God bless his word and bless you this day. Let us all pray. Father in heaven, we, we thank thee and we praise thee for the word of God to our hearts this morning. We thank thee, Lord, for thy truth. O oh God, we come before thee and we confess, Lord, our sins, for if we say we have no sin, the truth's not in us. But we confess, Lord, to thee our sins and we pray for that fresh cleansing in the precious blood. And Lord, forgive us when we doubt thy word. O God, we thank thee that, and we know that it's the entrance of thy word that giveth light. May thy word be continually set before us day by day. Give us a deeper desire to read it. For Lord, the more we read the Bible, the more we will have faith and the stronger our faith will be. O God, ground us in thy truth. And Lord, we pray for those in our service, those listening on who perhaps are not saved. Lord, save them. What you've done for us, do for them. O God, unite our families in Christ. That's our earnest desire and prayer in these days. Lord, just take us to our homes now in safety. Keep your hand upon us. Till we meet again in thy will. Give us journeying mercies. And may thy word reign in our hearts day by day. May it be our only rule of faith and practice in this, this generation in which we live. For it's in Jesus' precious name we ask it. Amen. Amen.